Hello, my name is Trigvi David Johnson, Dean of the Chapel at Hope College, and I have the privilege and opportunity of introducing to you the 2017 World Christian Lecture Series Speaker for Hope College, Dr. Nicole Baker Fulgram, who is the president and founder of the Expectations Project. Nicole, we are so excited that you're here at Hope. Thank you. Um, on your Twitter feed, it says you are Detroit through and through. <laughs> Uh, welcome back to Michigan Thank and you. tell Thank us what you. tell us what that means for you. You know for me it just means Detroit is one of the core sort of defining characteristics of who I am. Detroit is seen as the underdog. It's seen as the city that has gone through a lot and people consistently underestimate and maybe malign and I don't know if that happens to me every day, but I think there's, there's, some, there's an affinity I have for what it gave me growing up. It gave me an awareness of inequality, an awareness of, of just living a life in challenge, uh, but also seeing the beauty and the potential. And um, I'm Detroit through and through. How did, how did growing up in the Detroit area shape your vision, experience of education? Yeah, so part of what I saw growing up in my neighborhood was over time the economics declined and so as a result the schools declined and my parents who both had college degrees, my mom ma uh, majored in early childhood education, mm. she had a very, very strong vision for what she wanted my brother and I to have in our schools and so as a result we from the time we were in kindergarten, didn't go to school in our neighborhood public school. We went outside of our community to find what they thought were the best schools for us. But at the same time, I would come home every day and my friends in my neighborhood were going to the neighborhood schools. And as I got older, I started to hear just differences in terms of what they were getting versus what I was getting at another public high school across town. Huh. Were those conversations part of your household, like with your parents talking about those issues? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they were to some extent because my parents were very direct, especially as we got older, about why. Because we, we asked them those questions. Why, why aren't we going to King Middle School or Cooley High School with the rest of our friends that we play with on our block? And so they did tell us. And my brother and I had private conversations, probably without my parents talking about just the, the guilt and the awkwardness of being in that position right. and still having friends that we knew weren't getting what we were getting in school. You've devoted your uh, adult life to improving education. Uh, for thousands, hundreds of thousands of children. What was the moment in your life when you knew education was it? When education was what you wanted to devote your talent and treasure towards? So the moment that I remember most is a moment in Detroit sitting on my porch listening to probably New Edition because I was a big, big any fan. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, and sitting with my best friend who went to the neighborhood high school and didn't go to the very good across town public high school that I got into. And I was obsessing about getting my SAT and my ACT scores back because I'd taken them probably for the second or third time by then. We were going into our senior year and I was talking to her about it and she looked at me and said, well, Nikki, what's an SAT? And no one had ever told her about the preparation that was required to get into college. And if you haven't ever heard of the SAT or the ACT when you're going into your senior year, the odds of you being able to go to college are dramatically reduced. And she was brilliant and intelligent and just as smart as I was and could have achieved and, and done well in college, but she wasn't ready in her school just assumed that she wasn't going. And that moment definitely stuck with me. And it's a painful moment as a person whose best friend is in that situation, but it also gave me just a different perspective on, so it's not just that we're getting educated in different ways, we're getting prepared for dramatically different futures based on someone else's expectations of our potential. You started your teaching career as a member of Teach for America. Yes in Compton, California. How did, how did you get involved with Teach for America and how did that experience shape and form you in thinking about being a teacher, children, school systems, and what you're doing now? Sure, well, um, the summer before my senior year in college at Michigan, I went and spent a summer as a researcher at UCLA and I had already started to, to think about how do I combine my interest in social justice and race and inequality that I was studying a lot in my English major, how do I combine that with my passions around education? Mm -hmm. And so that summer, spending that, that time at UCLA and really digging into how race and education are at play helped me realize this is something I wanna do. I was an English major, so I didn't have an education degree, and for a host of reasons, staying an extra year at school to get that degree wasn't practical or affordable. Um, and 
Teach for America came along at just the right time. And it, it wasn't just that it was an avenue, it was the way they talked about teaching. It was fully framed and, and couched in this idea of there's this massive inequality in our country and you can be a part of the solution. And that was their entire mission, right, was to focus on helping to improve low-income schools and, and, and eliminate education inequality. And for me, it was a gift to find an organization that completely aligned with what I wanted to do. I just hadn't realized it yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so that took me out to Compton, California to teach fifth grade. And what was it like teaching in Compton, coming from Detroit? Yeah. How did, how did Compton view Detroit? How did Detroit view <laughs> Compton? Yeah, it's funny. Um, so. There were all sorts of stereotypes out yeah. there. Um, this was in the 90s um, about Compton, thanks to some, some well-known rap groups. And uh, so I had my stereotypes about Compton. And when my students found out I was from Detroit, they were like, oh, you're from Detroit. Oh, that's so scary. And I was like, you're from Compton. Like, so you were thinking, you know, I'm hearing a gun in my purse or whatever. It was just interesting to see how two communities, both who get maligned and both who had a lot of challenges, just had such a fear of each other. So that was one piece that struck me as interesting. But beyond that, I just found so many amazing students that whose families absolutely wanted them to do well in school and hoped, you know, had the same hopes and dreams for their kids that you and I probably have for our children. And they just, in many cases, didn't have the tools or didn't know what it would take to ensure their kids would get there. And in many cases, they didn't realize that their kids were actually really far behind where they should be in fifth grade. And that was the biggest hurdle that I faced was looking at the reality of, oh my gosh, two thirds of my kids in fifth grade are doing reading and math at the level of a second grader or below. And what do you do with that? And how do you try to move them academically when they've been behind for so long? So you, you think a lot about advocate a lot about issues surrounding the inequity in education. Uh, you founded a nonprofit organization, the Expectations Project. Tell us a little bit about the origin, the mission, and the hopes of this uh, education advocacy group mm -hmm. that you lead. So I grew up in, as I said, in Detroit and went to an African-American church um, that had a lot of prominence in the city. It was very large and pretty influential. And so in addition to learning about Christ and growing in my faith, I also saw our church really talk and speak a lot about putting your faith in action and what our responsibility is as Christians to care for the world and for the poor and to make things more equitable. They actually didn't just talk about it, they put a lot of that in action, which I appreciated. And so on many a Sunday, we would hear from politicians who were you know, running for office. I don't know if any of this was legal to do, but they would have them in the pulpit. They would talk about what they wanted to do. But then six months later, we would have those same politicians come back because the clergy would hold them accountable again in front of the entire congregation and say, okay, when you were running for office, you said you were gonna go do these three things to help our community. We haven't seen those happen yet. So we wanna know what your plan is. And so they had a a large amount of power and influence and were able to wield that um, to use their moral authority to, as I like to say, make elected officials do more of the right things more often. And so that's my framework for the Expectations Project. When I look at education in America, there are a lot of inequalities that we have to tackle. Some of them can be tackled by tutoring and more of us you know, going and, and spending time in, in communities and teaching, but a lot of them are so systemic and so entrenched that they're gonna take a significant amount of public will to again push those elected officials to do more of the right things in terms of where we put our resources, what types of policies we enact. And that's really the, the idea of the Expectations Project is to leverage churches, which again, have a lot of power and influence and we're just organized and we have this moral frame that we can approach these issues with to really organize, educate, and help us advocate mm. for systemic change in our local public schools. And part of the large inequality um, still that systemic issues have to still to do with um, legacies of race relations mm -hmm. in this country. And as you try to organize in uh, faith-based communities, Christian, um, it is said that the most segregated time of the week is 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock on Sunday. How do you see um, the issues of race continuing to uh, contribute to the inequity in, in school systems? And how can um, church communities of, of different ethnicities, different traditions. How do you see that as a common, a common ground issue that allows them to come together and maybe learn from each other a little bit better? Do you have any examples of where that's been done well? Sure. And a, a word of challenge maybe, um, particularly a place like Hope that's a predominantly white institution. Sure. 
Sure. Well, in terms of how the issues continue to play out, um, there's been a long history, as I think many people know, uh, that public schools mm. were legally not allowed uh, or not set up for kids of color, whether it's um, Mexican-American kids in Texas that weren't allowed to attend schools with white kids, or of course the history of African-American kids um, who weren't allowed to go to school with white kids. So that legacy is there, and the law may have changed, but there are um, definitely a, a lot of ways in which our own preconceived biases about people from different ethnic groups come into play. And, you know, not that I think, most, most of this I think is happening subconsciously, mm -hmm. but um, it definitely still comes into play in terms of what perceptions we might have of whether or not a student from a certain ethnic background ha really has the ability to achieve. And it's hard to talk about that because none of us, especially Christians, want to believe we're operating that way. But it's just a very common reality, unfortunately, that a lot of us to still struggle with because we're humans in a fallen world in a very race-based country. <laughs> so with that said, the way we see it play out in a couple of ways, um, looking at who gets accepted into gifted and talented programs in schools, which is a gatekeeper, right? To make sure that your kid is getting the very best education they can. A lot of parents are clamoring to get our kids in those programs, but there was a national study that came out recently in January that looked at thousands of gifted and talented programs across the nation. And they found that African-American students with the exact same test score for the gifted exam were half as likely to get recommended by their teacher for the gifted programs as compared to white kids. And the one mitigating factor that could offset that was when there was an African-American teacher present making that recommendation. And it's not that African-American teachers are perfect and white teachers aren't, there's a whole lot to unpack there, right? The, the, the researchers are very clear not to make overwhelming claims, but it would just suggest that we are still operating, right, in some sense of bias and subconsciously in the way we make decisions about kids in schools. So fast forward to what churches can do now and, and how those issues play out. We are really conscious to ensure that the people who are centered in the work we do in cities reflect the communities where the achievement disparities are most acute. And that's for a host of reasons, right? Part of it is trust, it's credibility, and also it's just the belief that people in community have a unique perspective on what their schools and their families need. And so that is not just a race issue, it's also a class and a geography issue. You know, the African-American pastor from the suburbs may not be the right advocate either because he or she doesn't know the community in the same way that the black or brown or white pastor, right, right. does who lives in the, in the community. So that's part of how we think about it and what we do. But we also know that we need allyship. And so we really do want and encourage relationships to build from our white brothers and sisters, suburban, urban, who may not fully understand the context of the community, but have a heart and a passion for helping to improve schools. And quite frankly, there's some amount of political and social and sometimes financial capital that those congregations can bring to, al to um, align themselves with our, our congregations in the city. And they can be a powerful force when you know a member of the state legislature is looking at 20 different pastors, half of whom are suburban, half are urban, and they're coming together and saying, we're gonna be our brother and sister's keeper and we want you to do some, some better policies and some better systemic change for our kids in our schools. Yeah. You wrote a wonderful book called Educating All God's Children. Why did you write that book and uh, what's its general thesis? Well, I wrote the book because at the time I was spending a fair amount of time going around and speaking at Christian conferences, and <laughs> which is what you and I, I'm sure, do. And um, because we wanted to get this issue of education out yeah. there. And every time I'd go visit the bookstore, because I love to read, and like, oh, there's a new book on Christians and immigration or Christ the Christian response to environmental issues. And I, n not one time did I find a book that was the Christian response to public education inequality. Mm. I didn't see it. And so then I started researching, has anyone written about this mm. in a sort of very, you know, from an advocacy perspective, and I couldn't find it. And at that moment, I was like, well, I guess it's time to write one because I keep talking about it. And wouldn't it be nice to have a book people can read so you don't have to travel everywhere? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, but there's something to be said right. for, for getting your message out there on a broader, broader level. And the message really is um, that regardless of whether or not you choose to send your kids to public schools if you're a parent or Christian schools or homeschool, we have a responsibility, we believe, to be, again, our brother and sister's keeper for families that don't have any options and whose schools are struggling. And this book presents, hopefully, a clear and compelling way that Christians can and should be involved. As you look at um, <clears throat> the biggest issues facing education in America right now, what, what do you see, what would you triage as the top three or a few issues, uh, and, and what do you expect them to be in the future, if different? 
So what I would say is expanding early childhood education. Mm -hmm. There's so much research that shows that the brain develops the, the, the most from birth to five years old. And if we don't have kids in a place where they can learn and play at the same time and get ready for kindergarten, mm -hmm. they're already really far behind. And so for poor families who can't afford to write the check to the $15,000 a year preschool, which is a lot of people, middle class as well, mm -hmm. that just sets their kids far behind. So expanding those options has to be something our country takes on or we're gonna suffer the, the, uh, the negative benefits of that for years to come. Another thing that's really um, weighing on me and a lot of people right now is just looking at how do we support kids who come to school who've experienced adverse childhood trauma. Um, and that particularly impacts kids growing up in poverty and the real biological effect it has on a child's brain and their ability to be ready to learn. And our schools, unfortunately, because they're doing a million things, are not set up to oftentimes identify that and give kids the support they need. And a lot of times those traumatic incidents manifest themselves as seemingly as discipline problems. And then we see African-American students in particular getting suspended from schools at four times the, the rates of their white counterparts, often for the same infractions, right? And so that has a long-term effect on, on the, the juvenile justice system and criminality. And so those two issues for, for me right now really have a lot of resonance given all of the issues around police brutality that we've seen in the last few years as well. Mm -hmm. What can a college like Hope College that is a liberal <laughs> art institution, we've got um, future researchers being prepared and uh, professors and writers, but also teachers. Yeah. Uh, what can a college like Hope practically do to prepare teachers uh, for the classroom of today and tomorrow to engage more deeply these inequity, in, inequities? Well, I think one thing, and, and this has come up when I've had a chance to talk to students over the last couple of days, regardless of where you teach, <clears throat> whether or not you go teach in a Compton or the Bronx or inner city Detroit, you're going to come across kids who are different from you, who have challenge in their life, right? Those challenges just exist everywhere in our country. And so, there's a broadening of how we think about teacher preparation to really help students become more adept at working in cross-cultural settings, whatever those might be, and also helping them recognize what their responsibility is to identify some of these broader challenges, you know, socio-emotional challenges, trauma that kids may have experienced. And again, teachers aren't social workers, so we're not trying to put everything on them, but being able to identify that and have teachers know what's in their toolkit in terms of referring kids and families to other supports, I think is huge. And honestly, tackling race issues. Um, we just cannot shy away from, from dealing with you know, the history of race in our country, how it still is at play in our schools, what that means for our own you know, potential biases around how we view other kids, and really spending some time to unpack that is it, just tantamount. And it can be uncomfortable and messy, and there will be tears, right? You start talking about your own privilege. It's a hard conversation, but I would say we shy away from it, and we're, we're not doing the, some of the meaty work that the gospel, I think, requires us to do to be good teachers, but also to get to the point where our churches, are, as you said earlier, are no longer the most segregated you know, time in our country on Sunday morning. The work you do is really uh, hard yeah. and <laughs> uh, draining. And what, what, what do you do to sustain yourself? How does, how does your faith help in that, and what yeah. Practical things do you do not to succumb to the inevitable frustrations that happen when trying to move large systems that you can't, it's never the one thing. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the last few years, and, and someone wrote a really good book on this, I can't remember the title of the author, but apparently it was, but it was good, I remember that. But it was basically this idea that when we put ourselves in the position of we are going to start a movement or we are going to change the world, like that's just the wrong mindset, mm -hmm. right? And to really realize that obviously, as we know, God is so much bigger than any system that we feel like we are trying to impact. And to, to take just some time and step back from that. And even in the watching the arc of the work I've been involved in for the last, you know, more than 20 years in education, I've definitely not seen all the type of change I want to see, right? And I may not see all of it in my lifetime, you know, that I, I don't know where this will end. But I do have moments, and a lot of them, where I've seen really substantial things change, whether in individual classrooms for kids, from a policy perspective. And those are the moments I hang on to, and the rest at some point, I know God loves the kids um, that we work with and on behalf of way more than I ever could, and I trust them to Him. 
And I also have a lot of friends that are and family that are praying for me. My husband, my, my best girlfriends, they pray for me and I have no shame in reaching out and saying, hey y'all, like it's time to send like a Twitter prayer request or, or sorry, a, a text prayer request. Maybe, maybe Twitter too, actually. But so you got a bigger um, audience. Yeah, a like. bigger audience, yeah. pray for us. And I think just being able to be vulnerable yeah. and real about that and not yeah. pretend that you have it all together because no one does. <laughs> You're immersed in policy conversations about education. And part of the Expectations Project is getting uh, churches, people of faith involved. What, what are a couple practical things you would say to someone who's just awakening to um, the issues? Mm -hmm. And what, what could they do to uh, begin to learn more, do yeah. more, uh, without getting totally overwhelmed or feeling like, uh, they quit before they start because they just don't know where yeah. to begin. Well, first I would encourage you to check out our website, <laughs> expectations.org. There are a lot of resources on there and we have an email list you can sign up for and we're happy to send you additional resources. Um, but from a for sort of practical where you are standpoint now, I really encourage people to first of all, begin to pray. If this is something that God has put on your heart, really start to pray and ask him to, to guide you. There's a lot of different ways to get involved in education advocacy. And I believe in that wisdom that God gives us. The second thing is, is to educate yourself. And again, that can be, as you said, a little overwhelming, but start to look at what's happening in the school district either you live in or if the school district you're in is great, what's the closest school district uh, or school near you that has a lot of economic challenges and start to ask yourself some key questions that we know matter, right? Do they have early childhood education for all kids? How are teachers um, selected and supported and retained? How much do they pay the teachers? Does the school district have AP classes, the same amount for every type of school? Or do the wealthier schools have more advanced placement classes and the poorer ones don't? So once you start to learn a little bit about that, then start to ask yourself, okay, are there other people in my church community who would want to learn about this? And then we can start studying these issues together. And then over time, perhaps there's a little cohort of us that say, you know what, we think there's more we can do. And we're going to at least ask to meet with someone on the school board and say, our church is just concerned about this and we want to learn more. And that's how that process can begin for you. And again, there may be an organization in your community that's already doing advocacy and definitely latch onto that one. <laughs> um, and so you can learn from them and, and start to take action together. But I think it starts with the prayer and educating ourselves and figuring out what more can we do from there. Uh, final question. Okay. Would you allow me to recommend you to be Secretary of Education? <laughs> That's funny and no. <laughs> We're going to watch uh, Mrs. DeVos and, and Ms. Secretary DeVos and see how she does. Well, Nicole, thank you for being with us, for gracing Hope College, for your thank wisdom, you. uh, for calling us to be people who care for our neighbor and who live out the call of Jesus to bring justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly. You model all of that and we're so, so grateful for you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.